Uh, good afternoon, everyone. We welcome you all to the Clef Lip and Palette webinar series three. Uh, to begin with, I would like to introduce uh, Ms. Mamta Karan, Senior Vice President and Regional Director, Asia. Over to you, Mamta, ma'am. Thank you, uh, Shrutika, and thank you, Team uh, Science Integra, for organizing uh, the series of webinars. And uh, thank you everyone to the audience and to the esteemed panel for making time to attend this. I will very quickly uh, talk about who we are and what we do. But firstly, I'll also introduce myself. As Shrutika said, my name is Namta Carroll and I'm the Senior Vice President and Regional Director for Asia at Smile Train. And I extend a very, very warm welcome to all of you present here today. Uh, some of you may know that Smile Train is an international the largest international NGO, which is focused on supporting comprehensive cleft care to children across the world. We have un a unique and sustainable model where we partner with local hospitals and doctors and support them with funding, with training and resources to deliver free cleft care across the world. Our collaboration with Foxy to increase awareness about cleft lip and palate in India right from the fetal stage is a very significant step towards comprehensive care for children with clefts in India. Uh, we've also jointly developed a joint protocol and that will be a useful resource for all obstetricians and gynecologists to guide patients with clefts and address their queries and ensure interventions at an early stage. With this partnership, we aim to accelerate our work by driving early diagnosis and treatment. Left lip and palate is a treatable birth difference that can be diagnosed by an ultrasound scan as early as 20 weeks of pregnancy and treatment and counseling can start right there. With proper guidance and timely treatment, children with clefts can leave healthy lives and attain their full potential. The only thing which is lacking is the lack of information about the timelines of cleft care and superstitions that can lead to uninformed decisions by the parents of children born with clefts. In the last 22 years, we have built a robust cleft ecosystem in India, partnering with almost 140 plus hospitals in states and union territories to support more than seven lakh surgeries across the country. And globally, we have programs in almost 90 plus countries providing the free cleft surgery to more than 1.5 million persons with clefts. Our partnership with Foxy is very, very special as both organizations have a vision for a healthy and productive life for children and mothers. This partnership is critical to accelerate early diagnosis, as I said earlier, and planned cleft management from fetal stage to adulthood. I would now like to welcome our esteemed panelists. And the first on my list is Dr. Rishikesh Pai, who is the president of Foxy. And he's also the founder and medical director of Bloom IVF Group. Thank you, Dr. For, uh, Dr. Pai, for taking up the time to be with us today. Um, I would like here to mention a special initiative which has been put, driven by Dr. Uh, Pai, and this is particularly special because it is one of its kind in India, which is called the Badlao Project or the Badlao Clinic, uh, clinics that he has established under his leadership for the betterment of women in our country. This initiative or Badlao, uh, you know, is, is towards bringing that change in women's health through the amalgamation of Eki Karan, Samantha, and Takniki, and all of them leading to the overall well being of women in our country. So, thank you, Dr. Pai, for this fantastic initiative. Next on my list is Dr. Madhuri A. Patel, and she is the General Secretary of Foxy. Thank you, Dr. Patel, for being with us today. Then there is uh, Dr. Sita Ramamurti. Dr. Sita Ramamurti is a consultant in fetal medicine and obstetrics. 
a polar multi speciality hospital in Calcutta. She is also the moderator and the leader for our session uh, today, this afternoon. And last but not the least, Dr. Padmasani Venkatraman. She is a professor in the Department of Pediatrics, Sri Ramchandra Chennai. She is also the Smile Train Nutrition Advisor, and she will take us through all the nutritional needs and, you know, what the kept project of Smile Train all about and how to kind of, you know, approach them from a nutritional standpoint. So thanks a lot, everyone, for taking up the time. And I'll now give it back um, to Shrutika and the uh, panelists and Dr. Sita Raman to take the proceedings forward. Thank you so much, uh, Mamta Ma'am. Uh, over to you, Sita Ma'am. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Mamta, for that wonderful introduction. And it's heartening to see that so much is being done in our country to spread awareness and uh, knowledge about this correctable fetal abnormality. Uh, you know, a lot of people are not uh, aware of what is there. And, you know, we need support groups and we need people in the who have had certain children like this. And I thank our president, Dr. Rishikesh Pai, uh, for his innovative in, uh, theme of this year of Takniki Patla, basically Patla, that is combining Takniki, Eki Karan, and uh, uh, Samantha, and our Secretary General, Dr. Madhuri Patel, for, for all her support in all the activities that we do. So today we're going to talk about uh, approach to a case of cleft lip and palate, what, how we diagnose, how, what, uh, how do we do it, when is the earliest that we can do it, and what are the steps forward once we um, you know, diagnose such a case. So with that, and I have with me a very esteemed panel uh, uh, faculty, Dr. Padmasani, will be talking about the immediate neonatal aspect of once the baby is born, because overall the couple need to know what is entire, what is there for them once they are uh, you know, given this diagnosis. So with that, I will start my, uh, I'll share my screen. Can you uh, see my screen? Yeah. Yes, ma'am, it is busy. Yeah, so the topic is approach to fetus with cleft lip and palate. Um, that's me for you, and thank you once again for this opportunity. So basically, as we all know, cleft lip or palate, with or without palate, uh, is the most common continental birth defect that we see. And the prevalence varies from anything from 1 in 500 to 1 in 2,500 live births. Now, the prevalence actually varies by race, but somehow it is uh, commonly seen that it is more frequent amongst the Asians and the Africans. But whatever it is, though it is a correctable abnormality, we are very positive when we see a cleft lip alone. It is associated with significant morbidity for the fetus of the immediate neonatal period, which is what we need to tell them about. And it has certain social and economic implications because of the uh, facial disfigurement that it can cause. Of course, it can be a part of spectrum of anuploides. So that is what we screen for and we look for whether there are any other things associated. It can be a marker of multiple genetic syndromes if it is you know, associated with other defects that we will see. And now, of course, with the major impact of the different machines that we have, the advances in technology, we have improved in our detection of cleft lips and palates much better, much earlier, and we can prognosticate them even better as we see them in our clinic. So in the context of facial clefting, we describe lip may be described as an upper lip only or the upper lip and the alveolar ridge or alveolus. So what we say is the overall incidence of cleft lip and palate malformation in live births is around one in 700, which is similar to that of Down syndrome and palatus actually. So here we are, we are concentrating so much on you know, nuclear translucency and every uh, those other things. Um, so, um, but we also need to pay importance as now as the pyramid of antenatal care is shifting to the first trimester, we not only screen for, for Down syndrome and other things, we also look at the overall anatomy of the fetus, look at gross malformations that can be lethal to the fetus so that we can pick up, pick them up early. But we also look at defects that can be picked up and so that we can screen them earlier than by what we do at 20 weeks and then counsel them accordingly. 
So the isolated cleft lips, that is plus or minus the alveolar ridge is around the range of 25%. And when you have different degree of uh, degree ridge with the lip, cleft lip and the palate of varying degrees, that could be around the range of 35%. And usually unilateral is more common, it's 25%, 10% can be bilateral. An isolated cleft palate is around 40%, but the point is that isolated cleft palate is more difficult to diagnose, and there the associations with other uh, syndromes or other malformations is much higher. So that is why the importance of cleft palate is there, but usually if it is um, associated, it is associated with cleft lip. So the critical period for cleft development is any time from the fourth to the twelfth week of gestation. And so, obviously, as we will talk about, that there is a primary palate which forms between the fourth and the seventh week, and the secondary palate which forms from the eighth to the twelfth week. So, this is the most critical period of embryogenesis when we're looking at the development of the lip and the palate. So, there is then this is important because we go back. If we see anything like that, we can go back to the maternal history and ask whether she was taking any medications that could have been that have, could have contributed to the mild development or mild fusion of these processes that will come up about and cause a, a defect or a cleft in the lip or palate. So if we go back to our embryology days, this is the, you know, as we start in the seventh, in the early sixth week, we have the frontonasal prominence. The most important thing you need to remember here are the three prominences, that is the medial nasal prominence, the lateral nasal prominence and the maxillary prominence. And they tend to fuse on either side of the midline with the nasal, uh, with the philtrum and the nasal septum in between. And any any problem here will rise, will cause a defect in the uh, in the medial nasal prominence would be the primary palate, and the maxillary prominence would result in defect in the secondary palate. And the fusion of these prominences is is what gives us a normal appearance of the lip and palate, which ends by the end of the 10th week. And that is why the critical period is between the 6th to the 10th, maximum 12th week. Now, the cleft of the secondary palate is important because it starts from below, it starts from the uvula, and it moves upward. So you have the two palatine shells fusing in between and then going up from downward, fusing in between and going up to the incisal foramen. So here, when you look, you see the nasal septum, it is indicative of cleft in the secondary palate. So an important point to remember here is the cleft lip and palate actually starts at the lip and proceeds to different extents in the dorsal direction. But when you're talking about isolated cleft palate, if I go back to my slide, it starts at the uvula and then it proceeds along the midline in the anterior direction and affects, then it affects either the soft palate or both soft and hard palate. And that is why it is important to know where, uh, what is, what, that is why it is more difficult to diagnose the isolated cleft palate because the origin where it occurs is, is it starts okay. posteriorly and starts moves okay. anteriorly okay. in the okay. anterior direction. Okay. Okay. So when you talk about cleft lip and palate, this is a, there was an earlier classification, but we moved on to a very easy Kernan's classification where the area affected by the cleft is labeled from one to nine. And, it, and then you just, it, each of which represents a different anatomical structure, like you have one is the right lip, two is the right alveolus, and then going on to right premaxilla, left lip alveolus. So, so ideally, whenever you are diagnosing a cleft lip or palate, it is important to draw this diagram and you sort of show exactly what, where is it, so that it is easier that we all speak the same language and anybody else looking at the report is also able to exactly identify where this defect is and go back and see. And this is also important for the postnatally, for the pediatric surgeon, for the people who are looking after the baby and doing corrective measures. So this is a very easy classification where you can draw this and decide what needs to be done, what where is exactly the defect happening or not. So according to our, uh, we have guidelines again so that we exactly know what we are looking at and everything has to be looked at in the in the similar fashion. So it says that the minimum evaluation of the face should be in an attempt to visualize the uh, lip for possible cleft anomaly, an anomaly. That is the minimum requirement. And if technically feasible, sorry, this one is, uh, yeah, minimum evaluation of the face should include an attempt to visualize the upper lip for possible fetal cleft anomaly. And if technically feasible, other facial structures that can be assessed, that should be done 
uh, which are not very difficult if it's done routinely, you have a practice that includes the median facial profile, orbits, nose and nostrils, because they all form a part of the face and the face is a window to all the syndromic associations that can happen. So you just don't look at the lips, uh, do it as a minimum evaluation, but you should also be in a position to assess the other structures which can contribute to the association of cleft lip and you know the uh, the the final phenotype that might have, might happen for this fetus. That is the median facial profile. We'll talk about it all this nose and nostrils. So we start off in the first trimester when we do our you know first trimester nuchal translucency scan, where you have the typical sagittal picture where you look at the nuchal translucency, and this is where you you look at the you know frontal process of the maxilla, the nasal bone, and your three spaces and your nasal translucency. So this itself can be an indicator because this is, uh, if there is a gap, there is a maxillary gap that will tell you whether there is a suspicion and we can go forward. And then if you, in the coronal view, if you see this retronasal triangle, you see the uh, uh, two nasal bones, the frontal process of the maxilla and the primary palate, if there is a defect, if the triangle is not completed, we all can suspect there is a problem, though the lips are actually slightly difficult to see in the first trimester, not as clearly seen as in the second trimester. But these are the signs or the you know telltale signs that we can say that there is a problem and we can we need to assess them further. So as I said, uh, this would be an early diagnosis, would be any time between 12 to 14 weeks, and there would be a maxillary gap in the first trimester, which will tell you whether there's a suspicion. Now, if we go to the second trimester, again, the ISOA gives us pretty standard guidelines as to how to go about every plane. And the 20 plus 2 plane approach is what we look at uh, at every organ. And so when you're looking at the coronal view of the upper lip, nose, and nostrils, this is plane 18, where you start from the head, you go on to the transventricular plane, and then you rotate to about, you slide down, and then you rotate around 45 to 70 degrees, depending on where, how the fetus is positioned. And then you come to the coronal view of the upper lip, nose, and nostrils, that is the plane 18, and then the plane 19, which tells you about the nostrils, and plane 20, which is the orbits, lenses and also the median facial profile. So if the, the, the question is that if you suspect something in the first trimester, that is if there is a maxillary gas, you can prove it uh, then and there is well and good, but that is when you will take additional images, a 3D rendering and go on to prove. But if there is a suspicion and not clear, you can call her back again at 16 weeks rather than waiting till 20 weeks and then confirm the diagnosis because the baby is much more uh, bigger by then. You can see the structures much more clearly and it will decide which way it needs to go so that if you want to intervene, we have enough time in hand. But yes, the uh, 20, the, the and mid trimester anatomy scan where we look at the anatomy in detail, it has to, you know, is much, much more clearer. And we should be able to diagnose uh, a cleft lip definitely by this stage. And uh, this, these are the planes where we actually look at the upper lip, nose, nostrils, or the and median facial profile. So this is the coronal view of the, this is the nose chin view, as we standardly call it, where it's a tangential to the nose, lips and chin, we take the uh, 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 um, image, and you have to see the intact nasal tip with two symmetrical nails. It's important that the two nostrils are in the center, because as we saw in the embryology, most of the clefting occurs on the sides of the nose, where the three, few, where the three uh, prominence is fused. So whenever there is a cleft in the sides of the nose, the nostrils tend to get pushed to one side. So even if you're not, you know, these are all indirect signs as we may see, though by this time a cleft lip should be very obvious. But the symmetrical nerves is important so that, you know, you decide that if it is moved or pushed to one side, there is a suspicion. And then you see the upper lip, lower lip and the chin. And then the intact upper lips actually rule out cleft palate. Sometimes if you go down a bit and without the uh, uh, nares, the nostrils, if you just see the upper lip, that itself can give you a very clear cut picture of where that is. So this is the pre-maxillary triangle, which we see in the first trimester, but again, we see it in the second trimester, sorry. And uh, we, we where the frontal process of the maxilla, the, the nasal bones, as we said, and the palatine process of the maxilla, they form the triangle. And if that is intact, we tend to make sort of 
that is a, that is a this is good negative predictor value that this baby does not have any cleft lip or cleft palate. Obviously, we would see this entire lip, upper lip, to make sure that there is no cleft lip as well. Now, uh, in the sagittal view, a very important uh, thing is to see. We normally see the nasal bone and the uh, 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 maxillary. Uh, the primary and the secondary palate here. But here, what is important to notice is the continuous palatal line that is noted here. And that was typically shown as the uh, you know, overlaps, uh, two bones overlapping here formed by the fusion of the primary and secondary palate, where the secondary palate actually merges with the Voma bone in the midline. And this is being very classically described by one of our own Dr. S. Lakshmi who has shown that this overlapping of the bones, this Voma bone, if there is, if you can't see that overlapping bone, that will give you a clear cut uh, suspicion that there is a cleft and you have to go further to see mainly in the palatal region and that will give you a very good indication there. So that is showing you about the sagittal plane. Now there are other views that have come into play as well, though those are the standard views, but these also should be included in your daily uh, um, you know, ultrasound if it is possible. That is the alveolar arch view, where did you take the axial view through anterior axial view through the maxilla? And in a normal um, uh, upper jaw, that is uninterrupted curvilinear row, and you can see the two teeth bugs as well. And uh, clearly, you can you know see that, and if that is uninterrupted, you can make sure there is no clefting here. And there is, if there is a gap, you can you know be again that would raise a suspicion that is a, a possibility of cleft. And if you can see the actual defect, it will go right down to see how far it is extending down to the uh, uh, soft palate. There is another way we also see, look at the bony posterior edge of the palate, and that was described by Paul et al. in 2020, where you see the posterior edge of the palate and decide if there is any clefting there as well. So here you can see, and here most of these views is very, it's, it becomes very helpful if there is some fluid in the oral cavity, because that demarcates, that gives you a, a window to see these structures more clearly. So as I said, in for the secondary palate, uh, for the cleft, as cleft palate always starts at the uvula, presence of an unremarkable uvula implies presence of an intact palate. So, two ways of looking at it. There is something called an equal sign, which is described by Borges et al., which is a which has been described as a novel marker in the diagnosis of isolated cleft palate. But also, you can look at the other way that if the uvula is normal. Uh, that means there is no cleft palate. And so if there is a cleft lip and you can't see the palate clearly in your normal sagittal sections, but in this trans, in the axial section, if you go below the trans cerebellar plane, go down, you will be able to see this equal to sign. And if this is normal, that means the uvula is present, which is, you know, a very reassuring sign that there is no defect in the palate. So this is an additional sign which you can put into your practice. If there is a cleft lip, you look on for the uvula and if the uvula is present, you you're sure that there is no defect in the palate. So again, you know, a lot of times what happens is because the soft palate is a soft muscular organ, you can't see it very well because of the shadow of the tongue, the shadow of the bony structures. So here, if you do uh, an extended view of the face, where you can, again, with some fluid in the oral cavity, you can see the entire um, palette going on up to the soft palate and you can see if there is any defect lying here. So this image also becomes very useful, but also, but this is sometimes difficult to get. It depends on the position. If there is um, uh, fluid in the oral cavity, all these would add to your diagnosis. But yes, this is a very important uh, additional tool to make sure that there is no um, clefting in the soft palate. So whenever you have a cleft, you always have to see whether it is just lip or associated palate. Usually isolated cleft palate is very, very difficult to diagnose. You have to make the patient, uh, you know, when you're counseling for routine screening, yes, cleft lip can be diagnosed, but isolated cleft, isolated cleft palates are very difficult to diagnose. But if there is a cleft, you have to see whether it is unilateral or bilateral, whether it is right or left-sided. The type of defect, as I said, it is lip or associated lip. The extent of the defect, depending on the views that you take, the coronal, the axial views up to the anterior maxilla, the, uh, you know, the, you, uh, uh, and then you see how far it extends down to the palate. The width of the defect is very important for, you know, for correction as to how your postnatal surgeons will want to do. The integrity of the maxilla and the angular ridge. 
symmetry of the nasal orifices, as I said, that is a telltale sign, and it depends on how far it is extending medially or laterally. And three maxillary protrusion, which is the anterior migration, if there is bilateral cleft, there is anterior migration of the heart palate and teeth, secondary to the bilateral cleft. So these are all the things that you would look for when you are suspecting the cleft. So this is a lady who came to us recently. She, you know, if you can see, there was. Uh, bilateral cleft and there was the premaxillary protrusion as well um, detected at 21 weeks she had no other anomalies everything else was fine we counseled her quite a lot we uh, obviously with bilateral cleft it is important as to what to be done next but um, and then there was this you know the transverse the societal view which showed a normal uh, palate here, this, the maxillary uh, part was normal, and so, but in 3D confirmed the diagnosis. But you know, the, it's so typical, it's so sad, which is why we're talking about this. That irrespective of the counseling, they went and terminated the pregnancy because they thought it was something very dramatic and they wouldn't be able to live uh, with such a baby. So, in bilateral cleft lip and palate, there is a pre maxillary protrusion which is seen as a prenasal echogenic mass, where this is basically the excess soft tissue mucosa under the nostrils, nostrils which, get, which gets put together, and it is a median process basically. And this median process appears as the pre maxillary protrusion, which can be very clearly seen if there is bilateral cleft and uh, lips. So whenever you're looking at evaluation of clefts, as I said, it's important to realize that fluid in the oval, oval cavity and avoiding shadow from the tongue and facial bones becomes necessary to evaluate the entire extent of the cleft. So it's important to give time and see the, uh, you know, these things properly. Maybe you have to call the patient back again later or maybe another day before you exactly tell what is the extent of the cleft. And um, a very reassuring sign is an unremarkable uvula means that there's an intact normal secondary palate. And so we have 3D ultrasound techniques that have improved the detection of palatal clefts and they provide confirmatory evidence along with 2D markers. A point to note here is that 2D is the mainstay of diagnosing clefts, lips and palates and 3D is to only confirm what you have found and then re, you know, uh, and reiterate that this is what it is and you know, give an exact pictorial assessment, but your primary method of di screening and diagnosing still remains 2D. So when we look at cleft palate, what are the associations with lips? So with median cleft, which exactly occur in the center, there is a high incidence of uh, um, you know, lethal abnormalities, especially uh, single ventricular holocaust and cataly, which can be easily diagnosed in the first trimester. And But if there is bilateral cleft lip and palate, there is a 15 to 30% association with chromosomal abnormalities. Unilateral cleft lip and palate, 5 to 15%. Isolated cleft lip association is very, very low. Nevertheless, as we would still recommend, uh, offer rather, uh, invasive testing so as to not miss those rare deletions and implications. So, uh, uh, you know, you can tell the patient that, yes, the association with an isolated cleft lip. Isolated means that you have done an entire screen and you have ruled out any other anomalies. Her primary screening for, you know, for aneuploidies is low in the first trimester if you've done your uh, markers, biochemical markers, and then you can sort of reassure her. But yes, isolated always means that even if the genetic association is ruled out. So as such, your isolated is not complete unless you have ruled out the genetic or chromosomal association. And cleft lip palate are also associated with trisomy 13, 18, and rarer chromosomal abnormalities. With genetic syndromes, there are almost about more than 400 syndromes in about 30% of cases. The more commoner ones are about golden heart syndrome, where you have anophthalmia, your macrosomia, the treacher colony ones, which is autosomal recessive. All these are important because, you know, the recurrence rate becomes uh, significant then as to how you would counsel these uh, couples. Um, uh, so because it's autosomal recessive and or dominant inheritance, there could be, and with 60% in your mutations can be there. And the fear of an anomaly where we see micrognathia, retrognathia, cleft palate and glossoptosis. So this is a basic algorithm as we can see that if there is a facial cleft, usually it's paramedian. And if it's isolated, there's a good outcome. So you can reassure the patient about that. But if it is complex, that is if it is associated with heart or other structural anomalies, 
you could have genetic or chromosomal syndrome, especially if it's bilateral and complex. The midline ones are the most dangerous because they are very, very high incidence of genetic and chromosomal syndrome, like Cornelia, T. Lange, Holocaust, and carefully associated with trisomy 13 and trisomy 18. So when you have, when you see a patient with cleft lip, you have to take a detailed history as to whether she was taking any medication in the first trimester. She might have stopped it later on. But at that point of embryogenesis between the A6 and the up to the 10th week, if she has taken that might have caused an effect. Once you find any anomaly that is the victim for any anomaly in the fetus, one anomaly you always have to have it do a detailed scan from head to toe again to search. Even if you have done it before, you again go it in a more detailed way to look for the additional anomalies because that changes the entire perspective of your counseling and additional investigation. And isolated or associated, you have to offer definitely you have to um, tell if it is associated with other anomalies, invasive testing for karyotyping and chromosomal microarray mainly is the mainstay. Prenatal consultation with pediatric surgeons so that they have a perspective of what they need to do immediately when the baby is born, when the surgery could be done, which is what we will hear. And of course, important to know that even if they terminate, you have to have at least some sort of DNA storage because if it is, uh, we need to know the recurrence, especially if it's syndromic, that we can counsel them for the next pregnancy. However, if it's isolated, uh, the risk is 5% if one sibling or parent is affected, and if the recurrence is 10%, it's two siblings are affected. So even if it is isolated, you can at least predict what the recurrence is going to be in the next pregnancy, whatever they have done to this uh, pregnancy. So this is, again, just an approach where uh, some people have... Um, adopted you confirm the diagnosis you always have to have a multidisciplinary approach you follow them up till birth and then after birth as well you have your meetings where your uh, you have your ultrasound you have your 3d constructions we have our fetal medicine specialist who provide diagnosis and then evaluate for other anomalies your you need to plan the uh, delivery though it doesn't require a surgery care center to deliver but at least plan depending on what sort of uh, feeding uh, necessities are done and then of course in conjunction with the pediatrician pediatric surgeon plastic surgeon about what the uh, what needs have to be done what is the surgery planning and so it all has to have um, in a combined way so that you have to provide maximum support and comfort that they don't feel as if they're doing wrong and they're doing anything wrong by continuing the pregnancy put them on to support groups so that they realize there are many children who are there who are, who are leading normal lives with cleft lip and palate, even if it's bilateral. And that is what we are here to support them for. So thank you for your patient hearing. Thank you so much, ma'am. That was indeed a very informative uh, session. So uh, from the audience, we have a few questions. We would like you to address the same. So the first question is from Dr. Uh, from Mr. Mandeep Khokar and the question from Vapi. The question is, uh, when can we detect cleft palate at the earliest during re uh, routine prenatal scans? So as I said in my presentation that, uh, um, you know, the presence of a maxillary gap when we're looking at in the first trimester, when you're screening for nuchal translucency and other aneuploidies, the presence of a maxillary gap uh, itself will indicate a suspicion and that is when you will suspect and you can actually diagnose them and then you can if you suspect you can call them earlier so earliest is actually around 13 weeks and then you can you know do a 3d rendering and confirm it with that and you can recall them again at 16 weeks if you're suspecting them okay thank you ma'am uh, the next question is uh, from dr mahesh prabhu from kolhapur the question is, what advice a medical practitioner has to give if he is faced with a couple with antenatal diagnosis of cleft lip and or palate? Also, if a cleft lip patient himself or herself comes for an antenatal diagnosis? Uh, I didn't get the second part of the question. What is that? Patient with? Yeah. Hello? Yeah, the question goes also, what if a cleft patient himself or herself comes with the antenatal diagnosis? Right. Uh, well, so if you, it depends on where it was diagnosed, the cleft lip and palate, I was considering there are many good ultrasonologists all over the country who are able to pick up these anomalies and with the level of machines that we have, 
you uh, you know if you are able to pick up you need to as i said go back and do an entire check again look at the entire baby so that the fetus from head to toe rule out other anomalies and if there are if it is isolated you could offer an invasive testing to rule out any chromosomal or association but if it is associated with any other anomaly you have to do an invasive testing to make sure there is nothing no genetic association and then counsel the couple along with the multidisciplinary team say that this is a correctable anomaly okay, the baby has no problems apart from feeding issues in the in the early neonatal period which can be corrected and once operated these children have a very good life to put on to the right people, the pediatricians, the pediatric surgeons, and make sure that they understand. And please, please do not advise terminations for an isolated cleft lip or palate. Thank you so much, ma'am. Uh, so uh, for the next speaker, Dr. Padmasini. So I'd like to introduce, my pleasure and honor to in introduce and invite Dr. Padmasini. May I have a CV, please? who's going to tell us more about once these babies' fetuses are diagnosed and we deliver and hand them over to the pediatricians. She's a professor of Department of Pediatrics at Poru, Chennai, Tamil Nadu, nutrition advisor, advisor at the Smile Train India. She has presented over 65 papers, of which 15 are international, multiple publications to her credit. She has authored three textbooks and multiple chapters and other textbooks. She's a co-chair task force on care of infants with clefts. And she's a member of the IAP for formulation of guidelines on digital wellness and screen time in infants, coordinator of the IAP fellowship in pediatric infectious diseases. She's a member of the Indian Academy of Pediatrics and Indian Medical Association, and also Royal College of Pediatrics in Taipei from February 2005. Welcome, Dr. Padmasani, and the uh, virtual podium is yours. Thank you. Hello, Dr. Padmasini. Not here. She was here. No, oh, I can't see her. I think she's got a technical glitch. Mm -hmm. She should be joining any second. Till then, madam, can you take some more questions? Yeah, sure. So the second part of the question which you said, what advice one gives to a pregnant patient who herself or himself is affected with cleft lip palate and who has an antenatal diagnosis of cleft lip and palate for the unborn baby? So it's good, isn't it? It's a positive impact for them that they are there here. I'm sure they have been treated and, you know, it, it makes your work easier that they have come this far and they have been leading a normal life. So I think half your work is done there, the positive impact here. But the rest of the counseling would remain the same, whatever it is. Yeah. Thank you so much, ma'am. Uh, are there any support groups for families with a child who is born with a cleft limb? Hello? Hello? Yeah. What did you yeah. Say? So the next question is, are there any support groups uh, for the families with a child who is born with cleft yes, limb? Yes, yes, there are support groups. Madam, you are muted. Sorry, sorry. Yes, there are support groups available which all across the India, you know, you have to just... Uh... Yes, ma'am. Yeah, you have to just contact your, you know, the uh, in, in every state, I think even in our state, in Hyderabad and Chennai, there are support groups which are there and you can ask, you can you know, get in touch with them and start uh, taking uh, help from them. I think Dr. Okay. Padmasini is here. I will just yeah. once it's over, I will tell you the details more about the support groups. Even Dr. Sure, 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 ma'am. Yeah. I can. Uh, yes. I would just like to add to what Dr. Sita has said sure, sure. that um, if at all there is there is a case, there's an instance of um, a diagnosis of uh, a cleft lip and palate. Uh, we have, uh, as I said, 140 partner hospitals across the country. And we have also the India's first cleft helpline, which is a 1 800 number, 1 800 And uh, anyone can call that number. It is uh, the, at the Smile Train office in India in New Delhi. And we will guide them 
uh, you know, appropriately on where to go and what to do and what are the next steps. So our panel of doctors, which are surgeons, pediatricians, anesthetists, counselors, um, and other therapists are all available for, and counseling as well, available for the kind of uh, information that is required for comprehensive treatment of object care. That's fantastic. If you could share this number, I think it will be helpful for all our audience. So that absolutely, say. absolutely. I'll share that again. And uh, we will, uh, till I will just request the Science Integra team to put it up on the screen so that everyone yeah. takes a note of it. And it is uh, a part of the recording of this webinar. So when you know people take a look at it later, they will register this number. Absolutely. Thank you for that. Thank you. Dr. Padmasini is ready uh, with her talk on post-thesis management of cleft lip and palate. All yours. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Dr. Sita. So we heard from Dr. Sita how more and more uh, clefts are being diagnosed antenatally. Now we will briefly go over the antenatal counseling and then what do we do for the baby after the delivery. Next slide, please. Orofacial clefts are among the commonest congenital anomalies that an obstetrician is likely to encounter. Cleft care begins from the time of diagnosis, and often this diagnosis is prenatal, and the care will continue into adulthood. Even though the care is ideally given by a multidisciplinary team, the first healthcare provider is often the delivery room obstetrician or the pediatrician. Next slide, please. This is just to give you an idea of the number of uh, children with cleft that you're likely to encounter in your personal practice. It is fairly common in our country. The incidence as uh, found out in Indian surveys is one in 700 live births. That means you can expect around 35,000 children with clefts to be born every year. Next slide, please. So these are the different types of clefts. The cleft lip alone can be unilateral, bilateral, or it can be a midline cleft. Next, please. The palate can be a complete palate cleft or a partial cleft or a submucosal cleft. Next slide, please. You can have cleft lip and palate, which can be unilateral or bilateral. Next, please. A simple classification has been given by the Nagpur classification, group one, two, and three, depending upon whether it is only the lip that is involved, whether it is the palate alone that is involved or both lip and palate. Next, please. Yes. So... Why antenatal counseling? What after you have noticed that the child has a cleft? As uh, Dr. Sita rightly said, cleft lip is usually readily picked up in the antenatal ultrasound. Cleft palate may not be picked up unless the baby conveniently yarns for you at the time of uh, doing the scan. So the advantages of uh, picking it up antenatally are there is time for the family to become psychologically prepared. There is time to educate the parents. You can plan the care of the cleft and plan the feeding, which is the highest priority in the postnatal period. Of course, when relevant, you can find out if there is uh, insurance coverage and accordingly, you can also decide on where you will continue with the cleft care. Then there is an indication. That is when you suspect that this cleft is a part of a syndrome, there may be a need for genetic testing and it is uh, for the near future that fetal surgical repair may be considered. But also, if there is a suspicion of associated anomalies, life-threatening anomalies, the option of termination will have to be discussed. There is also some disadvantage in making an antenatal diagnosis. There can be sometimes an undue amount of parental anxiety for a condition which is you know, eminently treatable. And it will be very, very unfortunate if for such a condition the parents decide to see termination. Next slide, please. So about one third of families, only one third of families when antenatal diagnosis is made, feel that they have been given adequate information about the cleft from their obstetrician or ultrasonographer. And all those who have had contact with the cleft team felt it was valuable. Next slide, please. And this is again, a published study on surveys of parents with uh, cleft children. They indicate that prenatal ultrasound diagnosis enables early education, preparation, and higher degrees of satisfaction with the multidisciplinary team. 
Pregnancy termination for isolated clefts is a very uncommon event, not only in the US, but also in our country. So long as we have explained to the parents about how treatable the condition is. So Madam has rightly said, once antenatally a cleft is detected, the ultrasonographer, the fetal medicine team will look for syndromic associations for other congenital malformations. They will discuss the diagnosis with the parents and tell them what to expect after birth. It is important to present facts and figures and be reassuring whenever the condition allows you to be reassuring. But the judgment and I mean, the decision on continuing with the pregnancy has to be made by the family and the healthcare providers have to remain non-judgmental. Hopefully, the parents will decide to continue with the pregnancy, in which case the management protocol has to be outlined and repeatedly the need for teamwork has to be emphasized. It is important not to overwhelm the family with too many details. If you tell them that your child will require care up to adulthood, they might feel overwhelmed. We can allow them to get information in stages. Whenever it is possible, early referral to a cleft team is important for optimizing the care of this child. Next. Often obstetricians are wondering whether it is a high risk delivery, but if it's a term baby and the cleft lip with or without the palate is the only anomaly, then they do not have a higher risk of birth related complications. So typically we do not call this a high risk delivery. They don't have to be delivered in a high risk obstetric unit. They usually do not need a tertiary level NICU. These infants can be roomed in with their mothers. But what they do need is access to appropriate feeding equipment and support in the initial days postnatally. So the obstetric team can locate hospitals which have the experience and the resources to support the feeding of children with clefts. And uh, as uh, Ms. Mamta has just told us, there are local and regional, uh, regional teams available and they can even assist over the phone. The immediate postnatal management should focus upon airway management, establishing feeding. These two are of highest importance. Subsequently, the infant, the neonate has to be examined from head to toe for other anomalies. Even if the ultrasound has not picked up, there are other anomalies which can be picked up on physical examination after delivery. And most importantly, at every stage, psychological support for the mother to encourage emotional bonding should be reinforced. And this is again something which we see it happens quite often. The routine newborn care should not be forgotten when all the attention is on managing the cleft. So the routine newborn immunization, vitamin K, they all should continue like we give it for any other newborn. Next. After you have taken care of the airway and you have established feeding in the infant, then is the time to give anticipatory guidance to the family regarding the management protocol. You might have already discussed this with the family if the cleft had been diagnosed antenatally. But when the diagnosis is made only after delivery, it is important to tell the parents, we will shortly be you know, talking about the timetable of care on what to expect, how the child will grow, when the lip can be repaired, if there is a palate cleft, when the palate can be repaired. After repair, what other care the child may require. And appropriate and timely referrals have to be discussed. Where should they get the surgery done? Where should they get the follow-up done? And when there is a need, also referral to units like a genetic consultation. Always the primary care provider will remain the liaison between the family and the cleft care team. Because from the antenatal period they have been coming to you, they will continue to depend upon you for correct guidance. As uh, Dr. Sita rightly said, an infant born with a cleft palate is not usually diagnosed antenatally, and sometimes the cleft palate may not be identified at birth also. Numerous times we have seen infants discharged from the maternity unit with an undiagnosed cleft palate, and they return with feeding difficulties and poor weight gain. So we strongly urge that every effort should be made to visualize the palate during the initial newborn examination in the birth hospital 
and cleft palate has to be excluded before discharge from the maternity home. Next. So when I talked about postnatal care, I said the first and most important step is managing the airway. Most children with isolated cleft lip have normal airway. Children with isolated cleft palate also usually have good airways unless it is associated with syndromes like theory robin sequence. Next slide, please. In theory robin sequence, there is breathing difficulty. And how do you know that the airway is being compromised? This is by the noises. There is loud snoring, there is snorting, and there is desaturation if you are monitoring the oxygen saturation. This airway compromise is because of the posteriorly positioned tongue. The posteriorly positioned tongue along with the small mandible and glossoptosis, it presses upon the palate and results in the uh, development of a U-shaped cleft palate. So these are the children in whom you have to pay particular attention to maintaining the airway. Like any other child, they will also require nutritional support. These neonates, sometimes they look deceptively well in the first week of life and they develop serious airway problems subsequently. So it is recommended that all children with a Peary Robin sequence be evaluated by a craniofacial specialist as soon as possible after birth. Next slide, please. So how do you, in the maternity home, after delivery, how do you maintain the airway? There are non-invasive ways of maintaining the airway. This is a child with Peary Robin syndrome. The small mandible and the posteriorly placed crumb, they, the tongue falls back and it obstructs the airway. So sometimes a simple positioning itself may open up the airway. The child can either be placed in the lateral position or in the prone position. If positioning does not open up the airway, you may have to insert a nasopharyngeal airway or provide nasal CPAP. If both nasopharyngeal airway and nasal CPAP fail to establish, then you may have to intubate the child. This is for immediate establishment of the airway. Subsequently, we have procedures which can open up the airway, like tongue lip additions. This is something which we can discuss in the follow-up period. But for immediately establishing the airway, positioning, nasopharyngeal airway, very rarely intubation. Next, please. The other most important aspect of newborn care is to establish correct feeding. Almost 1 in 10 children born with a cleft lip or palate, they die before one year of age. And malnutrition is one of the biggest contributors to the death. Something as simple as proper feeding instructions can make a world of difference over time. This is a child who was seen in September 24th and with correct feeding advice, you will see a, in a matter of just four or five months, at the time of lip repair, you see a normal weight child. Next, please. I am not able to see the timer. How much time do I have? You're okay, madam. You can carry on. No sure, sure. I'll continue. So why is feeding such an important issue for children with cleft lip and palate? Because of the cleft, because of the gap, they cannot generate the intraoral pressure that you have to generate for sucking. Sucking is an important component of normal breastfeeding. So suction is difficult because of the gap. There is regurgitation of milk from the nose. These children are slow to feed. They become tired quickly while feeding. Because of the gap, they swallow excessive air, which fills up the stomach. So that feeling of satiety is there. And all this, so much of time is taken for the child to complete a feed that there is maternal discomfort and exhaustion. Next. Next, please. Next slide. So these are the broad guidelines one has to keep in mind. The use of breast milk has to be prioritized. Just because there is a cleft, please do not give up on breast milk. 
we will subsequently discuss how to give breast milk to a baby with a cleft. Regardless of what milk you are using to feed the baby, the baby should be kept in an upright sitting position to reduce the milk regurgitation from the nose. Specialized feeding devices may have to be used and this has to be individualized according to the experience of the family members and the comfort of the team that is taking care of the child. It is important to tell the family what to expect. You should tell them that because of the anatomical defect, milk will come out through the nose. It should not come as a surprise to them. It should not cause any panic or alarm in the family. It simply has to be wiped off with a tissue. Also, because they swallow a lot of air during feeding, burping has to be done very often so that the air can come out and the child can take out more. Normally, babies are burped at the end of a feed, but these babies will have to be burped after every few minutes so that the air can come out. Next, please. Always try breastfeeding. You may be able to successfully breastfeed if it is an isolated cleft lip or a narrow cleft palate. Even though the cleft is expected to cause difficulty in forming a seal, the breast tissue is soft. So it may be, you may be able to mold with the breast tissue and seal off the gap. The mother can also try to physically hold the two sides of the lips together. What one should observe when the baby is nursing is if there is a hissing sound. Hissing sound means air is entering the mouth. If the sound is heard, the mother should try different other positions and try to locate that position in which the seal is best. And she also has to ensure that the nipple stays at the back of the tongue. This requires patience, time and this kind of support counseling is best done by professionals who have experience in feeding babies with cleft. The cleft nurse plays a very important role in supporting. Next please. Even if the baby doesn't have an effective suck, sometimes the cleft is so wide that the baby is only making sucking movements and it is not drawing out any milk from the breast. Even if the mother even if the healthcare professional has noticed that the sucking is ineffective, encourage the mothers to put the baby to breast for five minutes on each side. This is because sucking is very important for all the aspects of development of, a, of an infant. It is not just a source of food. It is a comforting factor. It promotes the bond between the mother and the child. It helps in the development of oral motor skills. And most importantly, the sucking movement of the baby on the breast of the mother helps in stimulating milk production. But do not allow the baby to suck for more than five minutes. The child will end up, the baby will infant, infant will end up burning more calories than what baby is able to consume. So at the end of five minutes, encourage the mother to empty the breast completely, either using a breast pump or by hand expression. This next slide, please. This should continue for as long as the mother is able to do it because even a small amount of breast milk is beneficial to the baby. The tremendous benefits of breast milk is known to everyone. I'm sure I don't have to you know, repeat that to such a learned audience. In children with, in babies with cleft, breast milk is particularly helpful because Whatever is given into the oral cavity is going to enter into the nasal cavity. And among all the options available, breast milk is least likely to irritate, irritate the delicate tissue of the nose and throat. And because it is less irritant, it also helps to reduce the risk of ear problems, which is seen so commonly in babies with cleft. Next slide, please. The expressed breast milk can be offered to the baby using special bottles with special teeths, but the hazards of bottle feeding are well known. So in our country, we are still encouraging the mothers to give this milk using a cup and spoon or indigenous feeding devices like Paladai. Paladai and Nifty Cup are two devices which have made feeding children with cleft very easy. 
the last resort should be a nasogastric tube. Nasogastric tube is actually not used at all, except in severe cases of uh, Jerry Robin sequence where you are not able to establish any other kind of feeding. There also it is used only temporarily till tongue lip addition is done. Sometimes you may have to use a combination of these feeding devices. Most importantly, we no longer recommend the use of feeding plates. Next slide. Very, very important to note the position of the baby. This should be the position while feeding a baby with a cleft lip or a cleft palate. 45 degrees elevation of the trunk. It encourages the milk to go inside rather than come out of the nose. And it also helps the swallowed air to come out in between the feet. Next, please. Babies do not produce much saliva in the first two months of life. With a cleft palate, milk often enters the nose during feeds. Though breast milk does not irritate the tissues much, formula milk leaves deposits and this results in a snuffy baby. Forever the nose will be blocked. So the formula fed babies will require two to three teaspoons of cooled boiled water after each feed to remove the milk deposits from the nasal airways. They are also vulnerable to tooth decay, but this is a problem which we see in older infants after six months of age. Good oral hygiene and cutting down on the sugar added to the milk is very important for preventing tooth decay in later infants. Next slide. Several specially designed feeding bottles are available. They are useful. They do have a role in feeding these children. There is the Heberman feeder, the Mead Johnson bottle. Pigeon Company has a bottle. Most of these specially designed bottles, they are made out of soft, squeezable plastic, which helps the baby to draw milk from the bottle without having to generate intraoral pressure. Usually, the special teeth is a long nipple that presses against the tongue, and uh, there is a Y cut at the tip of the nipple. The Heberman feeder was actually designed by the mother of, a, of an infant with Pierre Robin syndrome. It is useful not only in Pierre Robin syndrome, but also to feed any baby that has a weak sucking reflex. But again, again, we are reinforcing the importance of sterilization of feeding bottles and nipple. This is a Heberman's bottle. Uh, I just want to share our experience in Sri Ramachandra Hospital, where till recently we had a multidisciplinary team and around 500 children were undergoing cleft repair every year. <laughs> With the dedicated support of nurses, 50% of these babies were getting some amount of breast milk till five months of age, even the children with wide cleft lip and palate. Next slide, please. Next slide. I'm not sure if this video is going to play. This is the video of an infant. Can you see if you can play the video? This is a video of an infant being fed expressed breast milk with the paladin. Uh, no, ma'am, we cannot uh, no, we can't see. have the access to the video. I may be able to share the video separately. Next slide, please. Those of us from South India are very comfortable using a paladai. Mm. But people who have not used it are always worried about the baby choking because of milk flowing out of a paladai. So I just wanted to show how an experienced uh, nurse can teach the mother to use a paladai. The other feeding option is the nifty cup. This is reusable, boilable. You can even autoclave it. You can actually see the volume of milk going inside. There are markings on the side of the cup. This is made of soft silicon material. Paladai is made out of metal. So it is very gentle against the mouth of the baby. The ex milk is expressed, hand expressed directly. So this is the you know, bevel. The breast is kept here and the milk is expressed into the device. And it is offered to the baby. There is a small reservoir here and 
here you can control the pace of feeding. You just have to hold it to the lips. Even a newborn baby is able to approximate it and take milk from this reservoir. Uh, next slide, please. I think if the previous video did not work, this also may not work. I'm sorry. So the second video was an infant, 20 days old infant taking milk from a nifty cup. So for successful breastfeeding, we need the support of healthcare professionals, particularly lactation specialists and nursing staff. They play a vital role. It is important that one feed should be completed in 30 minutes. If you allow the baby or the mother to feed the baby for longer than 30 minutes, there is exhaustion. Both are exhausted. And to know if whatever breast milk is being offered is adequate or whether it needs to be topped up with a formula, it is important to monitor the weight gain of the baby. You expect a newborn to gain after the first 10 days. Initially, there will be a weight loss of 10%. Then the weight remains stable. Then the weight goes back to the birth weight on day 10. Subsequently, the baby should gain. 30 grams per day in the first three months of life. That is how you know that the feeding that the child is getting is adequate. Next, please. Post-discharge, it is important to call back the family after one week to see whether milk feeding has been well established. And like any other newborn, you want to assess the baby for jaundice and weight. Check the well-being of the mother. Try to establish a contact with a multidisciplinary cleft team within one week of discharge. The earlier the baby is seen by the cleft team, the better it is for planning the long-term management of the child. Next, please. So this is for all neonates. Like all any other neonate, infants born with a cleft should also have a newborn hearing screening done before discharge. Many of these newborns do not pass the hearing screening because they already have middle ear effusion at birth. So regular audiological evaluations and uh, ENT assessments should continue as a part of cleft team care. Next, please. Regardless of whether the diagnosis was made in the prenatal period or not, after delivery, the parents and the family need psychological support to adjust to being parents of a baby with a cleft. These children, they have a facial difference. They need more surgeries than a typical child. They have special feeding needs, other needs. The parents may be grieving the loss of a perfect child. There is variable amounts of anger and guilt. The mother may worry that it is something that she didn't do right or something that she did wrong that has caused the cleft, it is important to realize that unless you open up a discussion about these topics, these issues may never get resolved. Be reassuring because they also worry about the child's acceptance as you know, social acceptance after this. Show them the photographs, share with them success stories, connect them with support groups and give support to all the psychological needs for the family. Next, please. I think we have already gone through this. We always avoid bottles because of the risk of contamination. And even one episode of infection, gastrointestinal infection, is going to be a setback on the growth of the child. It will compromise the weight gain. So if a bottle is being used, ensure strict hygiene. Sometimes when you don't have access to special bottles, you can even use the regular feeding bottle. But with a hot needle, you enlarge the teeth hole so that the milk flows out without the baby having to suck vigorously on the teeth. <laughs> Next, please. So this is an overview of the timelines for cleft care. After birth, you check the airway. You assess for associated anomalies. You establish feeding. You make a treatment plan and pre-surgical infant orthopedics in some centers, certain molds are being used to help in surgery later. I think the surgeons will be able to give you more information on that. Follow the usual immunization schedule, monitor the weight gain, do a developmental screening. At around five months of age, these children can undergo lip surgery. 
start complementary feedings at six months like you would do for any other infant. Between nine and 18 months, plan the palate surgery. You do not want to wait beyond 18 months because there may be a difficulty in articulation and speech. The palate is very important for development of speech. Between six and 12 months, an ENT assessment is important to rule out middle ear occlusion. At two years of age, you measure the height and refer to a nutritionist for assessment if the height is below the third centile. Continue with speech therapy and then later in childhood, the child may require an alveolar bone graft surgery and orthodontic treatment. Depending upon how satisfied the family is with the appearance, there may be a need for lip or nose correction later. Next, please. So, so this is the same timetable of care which we discussed in the previous slide. Between birth and 24 months, they need infant orthopedics, nutrition and feeding, psychological support, lip repair, palate repair, speech and language assessment, dental care and ENT care. Next, please. Between 2 and 12 years of age, if a palate fistula has developed, that has to be closed. Depending upon the shape of the nose, preschool rhinoplasty may be needed. And again, these are all cosmetic procedures to improve the appearance. Ear care and dental care should continue. Depending upon the articulation of the child, speech therapy should continue. Throughout, psychological support and counseling should continue. Next, please. Care continues beyond 12 years of age into adulthood, depending upon the results of the primary surgery. Next, please. So it is important to share photographs with the families, share success you know, stories with the families to give them hope that their child will also have a good chance of leading a completely normal life if they follow the treatment plan. We come to the end of the session. I'll be happy to take questions. Thank you very much, Foxy and uh, Smile Train, for this opportunity. Thank you, Dr. Padmasini, for a beautiful talk and taking us through all the aspects of uh, neonatal care regarding these babies with cleft lip and palate. Thank you so much. That was indeed very informative. Thank you. Um, so do we have any questions, uh, Shrutika? Yes, oh, yes, ma'am. So, yeah. So, there's a uh, question from Coimbatore. So, Mr. Kanya wants to ask that, is it ethical uh, to terminate uh, based on the cleft lip and the cleft palate as an uh, anomaly defect from the parent's perspective? Um, it's, it's, uh, there is question of ethics is a very subjective one here because it is the patient's choice at the end of the day. We are legally permitted now to terminate any pregnancy up to the age of 20, uh, 20, up to 24 weeks of gestation. But whatever it is, despite all counseling, if the patient want to go that way, there is, uh, I mean, there is nothing to stop them from doing that really. So it, it is their decision at the end. But as long as they're informed that this is a correctable anomaly, and we are doing, you know, there are measures, there are, as we say, there are numbers where they can get help on to. It is totally their choice. So mm -hmm. I don't think it is not ethical to, if the patients want that, that is their choice. We can't force anybody to continue the pregnancy. I agree with Madam. It's very important that we just present the facts and figures and remain non judgmental if the parents yes. choose to go ahead. Should be an informed choice of the couple after having told everything and documented everything that this is what we've spoken about. They've told us, we've given, we've given them all the options, the opportunity, the uh, avail available treatment that is there, and then it is their choice. Okay, yeah, ma'am, so, so there is, yeah, there's okay. just one more question for uh, Dr. Okay. Padmasini. I would just like to come in here when sure. we're talking about uh, decisions and, you know, parents' choice. Absolutely, completely agree with my co-panelists. Um, the only thing is, uh, you know, from a smart train perspective and in our experience, because, you know, we are the world's largest in, in the treatment of cleft lip and palate, that uh, it is a question of who is privileged and who is not privileged. So, you know, people who are not aware, the underprivileged especially and the marginalized sections are therefore, because they are not aware of the line of treatment and what really happens if it is diagnosed and if you know there is, there is a case of a cleft lip and palate 
uh, therefore the role of um, the, the doctor or the you know ops and gynae becomes like really important to basically counsel them and let them know just not not just the options but also what is available for organizations like smile train because it is also a question of there are a lot of factors it's also a question of economics it's also a question of funding it's also a question of you know long term treatment of the baby which is about to be born so therefore i think that is very important for them to understand for this group to understand that those options are available with organizations like ours where you have like 140 partner hospitals who are not just offering the one time treatment but comprehensive cleft care which means that everything right from feeding as dr padmasani spoke about and the line of treatment which is completely available free of cost so nothing is really charged to the family or to the patient or to anybody so those kind of awareness is important and it, i think it's our responsibility as med medical professionals and the responsibility of this group to basically guide the families who are not that privileged who are not that well informed to tell them what is available today because they may not be knowing and they may never know given you know the vast population in our country they may never have the avenues to know what is what is really available and also available at completely zero cost so i think that is important that this group should know that that is available so that they can transfer this knowledge to their patients and to their families absolutely so, correct yeah any uh, we can agree 100% on that it is i know sometimes they might after terminating or they might think oh if i knew of this that this was there this was available i would have never taken that decision so that shouldn't happen that they don't know of what is the what are the options there and present in the society thank you so much for that yeah So, so there is question. one more yeah. yeah there is one more question for dr padmasini uh, what types of psychological uh, in interventions are most helpful for the patients with a cleft lip or palate and for their families this question is from aurangabad miss anushree has this question okay i am not a trained psychologist i am a pediatrician and this one sentence to the family you are not alone we are there with you at every step anything you have any problem you have we are there if you you know speak this one sentence when you meet the family it makes a tremendous difference give them i am so happy that smile train has now established a helpline every institution should have some contact number who can guide the family on their day to day doubts today my child had this problem what should i do today he did not take his feed properly what should i do so if you have this kind of a support allow them to ask questions allow them to speak what is there in their mind during my pregnancy i consumed something is my child having a cleft because of that i stepped out of the house very briefly during a solar eclipse is my child having this because of that so many doubts they have they feel so guilty that they have not been able to produce a normal child ask them what do you think do you think this happened because of something that you didn't do do you think this happened because of something that you did wrong and then tell them why cleft occurs these are a few this is my personal experience and these are a few ways in which we have been able to support families they later on come and said madam that one sentence that you said that you are not alone that gave me so much of courage to continue with the treatment of my child uh, true and i think this has to be reinforced time and again during the antenatal period just one period of counseling is not going to be enough because you're going to go back to society and then hear so many things which are going to have uh, so much negative impact so call them regularly for reinforcing what you've said and making sure that they have understood and they are with you very very as madam said very very quickly they're going to depression saying that they have done something wrong and their family sometimes might not be always be supportive one member of the family might point a finger and so that goes a long way in how they look after the child so regular reinforcement and positive reinforcement of being that we are there for you and you know we all as a family together going to sail through this is what is important throughout the antenatal period and even in the postnatal period okay so thank you so much ma'am that was all for the questions from my side i uh, hand over this to mamta ma'am for the vote of thanks
Yes, thank you, everyone. I think this has been a very, very informative uh, session, not just for all of you, but also for us uh, and uh, all of you know here uh, gathered here. I think it is really, really important to keep doing these to keep um, not only ourselves informed, but also to let other people know because uh, you know this uh, recording will be shared by the larger uh, medical fraternity who are also not present here, but in some way related to the cause. So definitely this is in, in a series of, uh, you know, awareness programs and sensitization programs through uh, the partnership with Foxy. I can't express my gratitude enough to uh, Dr. Pai under his leadership, all of this is happening. And Dr. Sita uh, Ramamurthy, uh, Dr. Padmasani and uh, the, the secretary, Dr. Um, I forget her name. Madhuri Yes, sorry, Dr. Madhuri, because she's not here today. So yes, uh, really, really thankful to them to you know have given us the opportunity to organize all of this. And uh, we hope to have these um, informative sessions as a regular uh, series with Foxy Very, I know they are already planned, so I will encourage all of you to register well in time. Please come and attend because this is very important. Ask those questions. Um, no question is a small or a big question. No question is unimportant or, you know, uh, you know, it, it, it's, a, you know, something which is not relevant. Everything is relevant here. We have our team of people who can um, answer your questions, not just on this forum, but also offline. You can get in touch with us. As I said, and I'm going to repeat the cleft helpline, which is 1-800-103-8301. Anyone can get in touch with us at this helpline and, uh, you know, we will be able to forward your, uh, the, the, whether it's a, a general question or a technical question to our team of doctors, to our partner hospitals, to help not just you, but also your teams and your patients who are coming to you to ask those questions. So thank you all very much in a big round of applause for Science Integra and Subhu and his team for, you know, taking us through this uh, very smoothly and seamlessly. Thank you very much. Yeah. So I would like to thank, thank the so much, on behalf of, uh, uh, from a big thank you to Foxy, our president, Dr. Rishikesh Pai Madhuri Patel, Dr. Padmasini for her very informative talk, for Mamta for all the support that you're giving us and for that helpline that you've provided, which is going to be a big help for all of us and uh, Science Integra, Mr. Subhu, and his team for putting it all together so nicely. Thank you. It was really informative for us as well. Thank you. Thank you, Thank doctors. You I joined Dr. Thank Zika. you so much. Thank you.